Number one, I'm very excited to be before you. I'd like to take you on a little journey and let you into the life of a particular man I used to know many, many years ago. Um, I don't know if that man is going to show up today. There he is. There he is. I knew this guy for a lot of years, and I knew him very well. Um, and somewhere along the line, we lost connection, oh, probably close to 20 years ago. Um, he's reached out to me several times throughout the years, and um, uh, sometimes I've ignored it, and there was actually sometimes I actually embraced a talk with him, you know? I mean, how do you know somebody that long and really separate yourself from somebody you've known that many years, you know? So if you guys don't mind taking a little journey with me, I'd like to share a little bit of his life with you, and, um, and then we'll go from there. So this gentleman right here, his parents were teenagers. His mother was 17 years old when she was pregnant with him. They're from a little town in New Brunswick, Canada. And at that day and age, it was not good to be 17 and pregnant. So his dad thought he would do the right thing. Now they're unmarried. And he took his mother and they escaped and they ran to Nova Scotia. At this time, dad decided that it's time that he had done something to, uh, with his life, and he joined the Canadian Navy. And um, during his time he was serving, this young man was born in a little town called Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. I don't think there was many people in that town. Um, but there was a hospital, at least. So a few years went by, and Dad and his mom, they picked up the young family, and they moved to Ontario, Canada. There where... His father would then take on a new role, working on a lake freighter, which often left him for many weeks away from home. So this young mother, teenage mother, was left to raise this young boy. Now, mind you, they ran away from home to get away from the parents, to get away from, you know, the ridicule and all that. So as a mother, she was not very well experienced. She didn't have much to... Uh, go by in terms of raising a son. She did the best she could. And it was a very interesting thing. They were a young couple, and when dad would come home, um, now she was a good-looking woman, but he had a rage of jealousy in him that uh, he always believed that in his absence she was out messing around on him. And um, from the time he could remember, he always seen his dad beat his mother. And... Um, so that wasn't too, too good for a young dude, you know, to witness stuff like that. As time went on, uh, at the age of five, he was now has a, another younger brother. And um, life goes on. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a very sad story. Sometimes it breaks my heart when I think about um, the life he went through as a young man. Um, he witnessed a really bad time at the age of five when his dad, literally the eyeball, was on her cheek. Very, very, very traumatic for a five-year-old. So about the age of seven, his dad got off the lake freighters and found a job in Windsor, Windsor, Ontario, with an international tugboat company. Okay? And um, now this job was about 200 miles from where they lived in a little village called Danny Coke, Ontario. So the dad would come home on the weekends, you know, and, um, you know, always had something for them to do, uh, the, the, you know, his, him and his brother. At the age of seven, his dad took him through summer vacation, would take him to the tug. There he would clean bilges, he would paint. And because it was an international tugboat company hauling railroad cars back and forth across on barges, there was custom papers to stamp, you know, Learned how to splice rope, you know, kind of some, it seemed kind of neat for a seven-year-old, but uh, the reality is, from seven years old, he, <laughs> he never got to play with his friends anymore in summer for the rest of his life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine as a seven-year-old that you can't be a kid no more? God, 
It's heartbreaking talking about this guy. He meant so much to me. So we're going to fast forward a few years. By the time he was 14 years old, he now had two brothers and a sister. And his dad said, it's time. We're going to bring the family together. So he took his family, and they came to the United States because at the time the U.S. dollar was much higher. So it made most sense for them to move to the United States. Can you imagine that? The family dynamic of a mom and a dad and siblings all together under one roof. But that's where all hell broke loose, guys. You see, neither one of them knew how to be a parent. (laughs) Let alone cohabitate, be in the same house together, right? So some of the things that he took away as a young man from his dad was he was taught, and they had values. They learned some values. Now his dad taught him, he says, to never trust a man that wouldn't have a beer with you. If you're going to go out and drink like a man, you sure better get up and go to work like one. But the biggest value he ever walked away with was never trust one of them born agains. Now, his mother, on the other hand, allowed him to drink wine and smoke cigarettes with her at 14 years old. His dad never knew anything about this, and his mother was really working hard to be his best friend. Not really parenting there, is there? Right? So this young man got to see a lot of trauma throughout his life. He totally mixed messages of what it is to be a man, to grow up and be a man, right? To understand that, uh, you know, that it's, you, you, you can't be sneaking around, right? You can't be beating people up to get your way or fix problems, right? And drinking was okay. It seemed to be okay. It seemed to be the thing to do, right? So we'll fast forward again about three more years. At this time, um, the young man was 17 years old. He was in high school. and uh, Actually, he was 16, became 17. He dropped out of high school. He was introduced to some... Let's just say it wasn't medical marijuana. But it was, it was some pretty good stuff back then. And um, he would find himself often getting high. You see, he didn't have much of an interest in education because he was never taught education had any value to it. And um, so he ended up dropping out of school. Now, when he dropped out of school, now, he, mind you, he went back to try to see if he can finish it, but not with much success. But through that time, at 17... He decided he was going to move out of the house. And he moved out of the house. He hooked up with three friends that he had come together through other mutual friends and moved into a house with them. Now, his dad, there was no way. His dad wasn't saying, no, go back to school. His dad says, you're going to stay working. Sure enough, he got to keep a job on the tugboats. That was all right. So by the time his dad, uh, a couple years went by, by the time he was 18 years old, his dad went ahead and started his own tugboat company. And he brought him on board. He says, you know what, son? He says, I want you to run my tugboat company. So at the age of 18, he became a tugboat captain. He ran nice size uh, barges and tugs, and they're hauling a lot of rubble and whatnot. And, you know, at 18 years old, that's, that's something else, man. This guy was 18 years old. Man, he reached back, brought a couple buddies on that he used to hang with. They were his deckhands. Continued with the drugs, though. That continued to go on. And um, actually, it got a little more intense as he found himself getting involved with the the fun stuff, the chemical drugs, the acid, the mescaline, cocaine. And, um, you know, he really didn't know how to cope with life or cope with people, and this seemed to be a pretty good out for him, right? Because he could be anybody he wanted to be within that frame of mind. You know what I mean? It really helped take care of the past and the hurts and the pains. And this was a good place to mask yourself. By the time he was 21 years old, the contract for the barges had run out. And for the very first time in his life, this young man ran out of work. He was unemployed. This was devastating. As the only identity he had was his job. He had nothing else to know himself by. He was a tugboat captain, 18 years old, 21, no more work. He ran into a friend after a month of being out of work that had an opportunity in a 
shall I say, a land job, having grown up on the lakes. Um, it seemed kind of odd that he would want to take a land job. Who would want to work on the land after a lot of people sitting here love it when they get on the water? Why would you pass something like that up? So he took on this job. They had an opening for a welder. Now, back in that time, it only paid $5 an hour for a stick welder. He got into this plant. Because he had such a great work ethic, because he can go out and drink like a man, and he would always show up to work. Because everybody he hung with drank beer too, so he could trust them. Right? And nobody bought into any of that religious crap or any of them cats that were trying to run around talking about Jesus. So he had a pretty good thing going. So in no time, he was up to 13 bucks an hour. He was now able to afford his own apartment. Um, but through this time, he started disconnecting from all his friends. Now, he started getting control in his life with the drugs, because now all he was doing was smoking dope and drinking beer. Put those chemical drugs away. He's got a good, good handle on this stuff now, right? I mean, it's just pot. It doesn't do nothing to you, <laughs> right? And then he found himself, he was set up on a blind date, one night stand, it ended up turning into... Didn't see the lady. A couple months go by, a phone call comes through. She tells him she's pregnant. Well, he wasn't having any of that. He said, you're going to be my wife. You're going to move in with me, and I'm going to take care of that baby. So it took place. Three years to follow, came another child. There was no love in this marriage. There was no anything in this marriage. But he was doing the right thing. So a few more years go by. And it's time to make a change. Different scenery. It's time to move up north. I mean, that's where it's at, right? Lots of woods. You can go hunting. You know, you wake up in the morning. You got no neighbors. They're few and far between. So he took on a job in a little machine shop up, up in k -Pack. You guys know what k pack is, don't you? Chickens and pigs and cows. That's what that is. So he took a job up there, and he moved up there. And moved his, he bought a five-bedroom farmhouse. He bought a few acres. Had the barn still on there. And back in then, that time, you could do all this for $63,000. Can you imagine getting a mortgage on a $63,000 house now? I mean, it's like, that's like a down payment now. So... He got there with this young family, and then he went out on his picnic table, and he sat there, 25 years old, and he looked around at all the hills, because it was hilly up there, and he looked at the woods and just the beauty of everything, a bonfire was going, and he sat there and he thought to himself, How much further have I come than my father at the age of 25? How much more of a man am I than my dad was at the age of 25? Man, he never even had us together until he was well into his 30s. And he sat there and he thought about it. He looked around. He said, I've got a home. I've got my family together. I've got a job I got my drug situation under control. I'm just smoking pot now. And he said, all I got to do now is die. All I got to do now is die. The rest of my life, I've accomplished everything I need to accomplish in life at 25 years old. Yeah, I said that. That's me. 25. Little did I know that after that statement that my life surely was going to start the process of dying. Um, it was very difficult. The first couple of years, my then wife abandoned me with the children. It was me and the children. Because what I learned from my parents was I moved far enough up north that I couldn't be involved with my parents. I didn't have any help. So I did what I thought was right. I reached out to the homeless shelter, the women's homeless shelter, and Port Huron, talk to the counselor. Do you have a young woman with a 
child, children, doesn't matter. I've got plenty of room, but I, I, I need somebody that I'll give room and board to if they would just come and be at my home to take care of my kids so I can go to work. And certainly that worked out for a minute. As it turns out, the reason she became homeless was because she was a junkie. And uh, we ended up getting stoned together quite often. And it was not a good thing. My then wife came back. And all hell broke loose again. Because she came back with a boyfriend. She had a boyfriend. Didn't go well with me, obviously. Didn't go well at all for them. You see, there was a time in my life back when I was 18. I lived on the tug for one year down at the foot of Clark Street where Atwater is. It used to be called Detroit Harbor Terminals where the gantries were and used to love and load. The next street up was Fort Street. Used to have a bar every other block. I used to go up there by myself start fights. I was a little crazy. In fact, that dude looks a little crazy. He didn't win many fights, but he was crazy enough to get them started. Okay? So, I won the fight, the physical fight that time, but I went to jail. My life started falling apart. I've now just lost my house. I've now just lost my kids. I've now just lost, I had this acreage, my achievement is gone. The me is gone, I'm gone, everything's gone. And I found myself a working homeless man. My address was 1985F150. It's a Ford pickup truck I lived in. I kept pouring money into the house because I wasn't going to see my family, my children, go without. At least I had that much of a value to take care of my children. And um, because I reverted back to drugs, I found myself with a buddy that I hadn't seen in years, and we went a little further up north. And um, maybe some of you know, maybe you don't. Uh, me and him did an eight ball of cocaine. That's a lot of coke. And I was coming back. I-75 there was Zawaki is. And there was some trouble on the bridge, and we had to take a route. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was full of pride. I couldn't tell anybody. I'm a man's man. I'm not going to tell you I hurt. I'm not a sissy. Come on, keep it real. I'm not a sissy. But I would always listen to talk radio, Dr. Joy Brown, Dr. Laura Schlesinger, you know. I would listen to and even watch, man, Phil Donahue, man. I mean, you know. Um, and believe it or not, um, I can't, what was that one lady to me? It doesn't matter. Anyway, they would always bring psychologists and psychiatrists onto the show, you know, therapists and tell you, you know, and they would bring people up, yeah, I'm going through this. Well, you need to do, 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 and you're going to be fixed. So I'm listening to this radio, Dr. Laura Schlesinger. How many of you guys know Dr. Laura Schlesinger is a Jewish woman? So this lady calls in, and uh, <laughs> boy, is she hitting Every single thing that's going on in my life, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And I'm sitting there, and I'm getting all excited. Oh, my. All this time, I'm finally going to get the answer I need so I don't have to live like this anymore. The lady says everything else, and then there's this pause, and I'm just, and all of a sudden, Dr. Laura comes back. She says, do you have a Bible at home? Are you serious? Are you serious? I got mad. I got mad. Because she always gave good advice, and she's going to the Bible? Are you crazy? What's that going to do for me? I know better to believe anybody's going to talk about a Bible. Get real. So a little bit of time went on, um, and my sister reached out to me. She says, I want you to come live with me. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. So eventually I went ahead and parked in her driveway and slept my truck in her driveway. She would come out, hey, get in the house. I said, no, I don't want to impose. I said, I'm just glad I've got a place that I'm kind of safe. I can park and sleep here. That went on for about a week, and I come in the house. Oh, a bed. Wow. Wow. Big deal. Beds are pretty comfy at this point after sleeping on the front seat of a pickup truck for months. You know? 
And uh, she happened to have a Bible in there, and I got thinking about it. So Dr. Laura told this lady, I want you to read the book of Job. I thought about that drive I had. My sister, now she had a Bible in her bookcase. Now, I'm going to mind you, it was just there because everybody had to have a Bible in her home. It's not like anybody was using it or reading it. It was an IV. I pulled it out. I found what appeared to me to read Job. I couldn't find any J-O-B-E or J-O-A-B or anything like that. So I found Job, Job, and I read this story. Very interesting story to me, and I got thinking about this. I said, here's a man that had it all. Here's a man that lost it all. Here's a man that had his friends say, hey, Job, man, you should have done this. Or, hey, Job, if you'd only done that. And then Job finds himself alone with God, and God says, hey, where were you? When the deer gave birth to the fawn. Where were you when I said the ocean comes this far? Where were you? And Job recognized and realized the sovereignty of an almighty creator. You see? I continue to read the story. And at the tail end of the story, Job gets back much as, twice as much stuff and more years added to his life. I thought to myself, you know what? There's something up with this God stuff. I don't know what it is. But it, it, it struck me to think there's something up with this. And then I thought back to Dr. Laura, who I trusted as a, as a good giver of advice, you know. I said, there's got to be something up with this. So I had a divorce in a court up, way up north that I had to go to. And I was going in there kind of excited, saying there's something up with this God stuff. If he said, if I could recognize who he is, even though I'm still not doing it, I went right to the end part. Right? Kind of missed that whole God thing. But I went right to the end part. I'm going to ask for custody of my kids in this divorce. My ex-wife agreed to me having my son. Reason? He was a little bit of a tattletale. She really didn't want him around. So I got custody of my son. It was easy now. I had her address. So before I actually took possession of my son, I had to find a daycare for him. I started listening to Christian radio, and I'm here and saved and born again. I'm not quite getting none of this stuff, you know. So I was driving around. I, my sister lived in Oak Park, so I'm driving around Oak Park looking for some sort of Christian daycare of some type. And I'm driving down Nine Mile Road, and this voice says, pull in here. Now, I talk to myself a lot. <laughs> and it was my voice that I heard, but it wasn't me giving that command. It was the audible voice of God. It was windy that day. I pulled into that parking lot. There was a brand new daycare, had a banner that was blown in the wind. I would have drove right by it. It was Heavenly Haven Daycare. I went in there to inquire. Of course, I was greeted with all this lovey-dovey Christian stuff. Whatever. There was a guy I had lived up across the street up north that went to church every Sunday, but he drank with me and smoked pot all through the week. Difference between me and him, I slept in on Sundays. You see? So I was never impressed. I always thought Christians were hypocrites. It's the kind of life I've seen from them. So I get my son enrolled. I get custody of my son. My son spends the first week in his daycare. Every day I go in there, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. They're all lovey and dovey. It was like, oh my God, stop already. But I'm comfortable, though, because, you know, they're all lovey and dovey, and my son's getting what he needs. So the pastor who owned it, she's, I asked her one day, I says, hey, I keep hearing about this saved, and I keep hearing about this born again stuff, you know, and I'm not really sure. Like, saved from what? I mean, really, saved from what? What, do you, what, do you, what does that mean? And to be born again, all that just kind of ridiculous to me, you know? So she took me in her office. She opened up her Bible. Romans chapter 10, right? Verses 9 and 10. We're going we're gonna to talk about what it means to confess your sin. I had nothing to lose. I repeated after her. And I half-heartedly gave my life to Christ that day. A week goes by. I'm still smoking dope, drinking beer. Nothing's changed. Now, I was never big in education, but I did. I mean, I got a doctorate in cussology. Cussing was easy money for me. It was easy. I would always be mindful of old people, and I'd be mindful of young kids. But to talk to somebody 
it was easy just to cuss. So I got on the phone with a friend of mine. He was checking how, how things going. After an hour of conversation, I'm smoking dope, drinking beer. We get done. He says, Joe. I said, what's up, man? He said, we had an hour of conversation. You didn't cuss one time. Wow. I'm telling you, it was part of my life. Cussing was part of who I was. It was what I did. You know, you know cuss like a sailor. Well, I was a sailor. I, you know, I came by it naturally. It was easy to do. But I thought about that confession I made the week before. I said, what is going on with this? This is, this is very, very interesting. So I start asking more questions. And the, I says, well, I said, you know, I, I really got a problem with the Bible, thee, thou, though. You know, who, who, how do you get through that stuff? I said, oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a Bible. I'm going to tell you what to get. Now, this is the Bible. I've had this Bible since day one. It's fallen apart. I've got more notes and stuff in this Bible. But this is a parallel Bible. She said, you'll need the King James for studying. Didn't quite know what that meant. In the Living Translation, it'll be more palatable. You'll understand what they're saying. I said, okay. So I got the Bible. I said, where do I start reading? I really wasn't that excited from starting at Genesis and going through this whole thing, right? It's like, what does it mean to read your Bible? It's like, oh, God, that's, those words are small, and there's a lot of pages, you know? But I, I, I hadn't quite. I just knew something was going on with my life. So I found myself going through the Bible. Now, mind you, I've only got custody of my son at this time, and I'm going to work on my daughter. I'm going through the Bible, and I end up in 2 Corinthians. Now, this is a verse we've shown on the screen, I think, the last three weeks, two weeks for sure. I came across 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I'm going to tell you something. Nobody laid hands on me. Nobody said a prayer over me. But the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now, anybody know about this knot in their gut right here? Does anybody know about this knot in their gut right here? Drugs take it away, booze take it away, and it's there again the next day. And then you drink more booze, and it goes away, and it comes back. You take more drugs, it goes away, and it comes back. Passed away the old. That knot at that very moment, the guilt that I had, the guilt that I felt for, lie, for, for my whole life of treating my kids rotten, not knowing how to raise them, just, just being an ignorant person my whole life. How can, how can he just make everything go away? You can't. This guilt is tormenting. It's killing me. I become a new creature. The Holy Spirit came upon me at that moment. That knot that I had carried for years was gone. Gone. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you something right now. I got stoned good. I knew how to get stoned, man. I knew what a good buzz was, and I knew where to stop because I wasn't going to mess it up by passing out. You know what I mean? But I'm going to tell you, of all the years and all the dope that I did, I had never been so high in my entire life as I was the night that the Holy Spirit came upon me and said, Joe, today is the day that you begin your new life. Today, I'm going to give you new life. My God, I want it. It was around midnight. I remember distinctly it was around midnight. And I wanted to go outside. And I wanted to pound on every door in that neighborhood and said, you don't know what you're missing. You need this Jesus. You can't live without this Jesus. I know my life. I know the man I am. And when I talked about that old man that was up on the stage, that I, he would reach out to me and sometimes I would entertain that. Some of us right here, right now, are still entertaining the old man. Not allowing yourself to be the new creature he wants you to be. Some of you are sitting in here right now with that knot still in your, right here. How is it that we can all agree we know about this knot if God didn't intend for this knot to be a recognition or a physical sign that something ain't right? 
This knot has never returned. Ever. I want to tell you something. The scripture says, in Christ. So there's a condition here, isn't there? We have to be in Christ, right? So in Christ, what are we? We're free. In Christ, we're what? We're blameless. In Christ, and Josh talked about it last week, we're chosen. And one of my favorite verses is from uh, uh, John 15, 16. And he says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I've ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit. Not only that, that your fruit would remain. And that whatever you ask of my Father, in my name, he's going to give it to you. How's that? I belong now. I'm a somebody. That life that at 25 where there was nothing left to achieve and the drugs and the booze and the, and, 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 and the, the abuse and, 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 and the trauma, all that stuff, that wasn't me anymore. That wasn't me anymore. Not only am I chosen, I'm forgiven. <laughs> wow! Boy, that was the biggest guilt thing right there. You know, how many times we come in and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, well, sorry means nothing if the behavior doesn't change. Can't change the behavior without the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you one thing. This word is alive. It is alive. I'm going to give you a real quick nugget. So the booze went away. The cussing went away, right? The pot went away. But you know what didn't go away? I struggled with smoking cigarettes. Got a problem here because the woman I was chasing, this beautiful lady over here, happens to be a radi in radiation oncology, cancer, not going to deal with a cat that smokes. Not that it mattered a whole lot. She didn't quite know I was after her. But <laughs> so I prayed, oh, Lord, give me the strength to, to stop smoking. Lord, you know, I'm, I'm trying the gum and I'm trying all this here. So I found myself, I'm reading the Bible in a passage in Matthew. And his disciples come back and they said, Lord, you know, we went out and we cast out demons in your name and we did this in your name, but there were some things we couldn't do. What's going on? And Jesus said, well, some things are done through prayer and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, Joe, fast those cigarettes. I did it. After 20 years of smoking, three days later, now almost 20 years later, I haven't had a taste in my mouth for a cigarette. That's the power of the living word. That's the power of believing in that living word. This Bible's rough and tough and tore up. But you know what else I am? I am redeemed. Let me tell you, the life, and anybody in here that has been struggling with life, how do I make up all that time? How do I make up all that lost time I put into this and that? How am I ever going to reach or obtain the very things that need to be attained? When you're redeemed, so is the time. The time is redeemed. He has put me in a position. Now, there's a difference between vocation and profession, right? In my vocation, he has positioned me. In my profession, I'm a Christian. I profess to be a Christian. That means that the amount of work that's involved in being a Christian is pertinent. That work consists of reading my Bible. That work consists of praying. That work consists of telling other people about Jesus Christ. That they too can have freedom. That they too can live a life. Not survive. Not just get by. Jesus says, I come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That's what we have to do in our profession. Our vocation, I learned in my purpose that it's just a platform to touch and reach people. So often we get so wrapped up in the things that we do for work that we identify with that, this is who I am. No, your profession is who you are. If you claim to be a Christian, you are who God says you are. That's your profession. It's kingdom living, kingdom life. I continue to read. I get to chapter 6. And I think today about everybody in here. Read in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. 
Then at the right time, I heard you. And on the day of salvation, I've helped you. And today, if there's anybody in here, today is the right time. Today is truly your day of salvation. And I would ask that everybody who wants that salvation to please stand. Anybody that has not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And anybody who wants to reignite that relationship with Christ. Please stand. I would ask that you stand. Anybody that wants to stop identifying with the things from the old man. Anybody. I want to pray for you guys. And if you guys would all join me.